Initially, the only way sailors could detect an enemy submarine was to see it. By World War I, the best way, and most often the only way, to sink a sub was to explode a large can of TNT next to it. However, as submarines became a more formidable threat to the safety of sailors, ships, and supplies, military planners quickly scrambled to develop the special weapons and coordinated tactics of anti-submarine warfare. The tables were turned. The hunter now became the hunted. From its earliest days, the U.S. Navy has been armed for one purpose, to maintain freedom of the seas. For many people, this projection of power is symbolized by surface ships and supersonic aircraft. These systems are often in the limelight, capturing headlines in the public's imagination. Alongside them, though, is a team of quiet professionals with a job that may be less glamorous, but is growing more important every day. Their wartime mission is deadly serious, to hunt down, identify, and destroy a most elusive adversary, an enemy submarine. It has been said that of all the types of naval warfare, the anti-submarine battle most occupies the thinking of senior strategists, for no other weapon is as surprising and deadly as the submersible ship. Although the submarines are out of sight, they aren't completely out of reach. Carrier-based Vikings patrol thousands of miles per flight, searching for the proverbial needle in a haystack. Ship-based Seahawks join them, listening for the telltale sounds of an intruder below. Long-range P-3 Hunter killers are on a watch for hours at a time, while deep-diving attack submarines track their counterparts all over the world. In the Cold War years, anti-submarine warfare was no less difficult, but at least the enemy was clearly defined. Until recently, the Soviet Union was the threat. At one time, in the 1980s, the Russian Navy was accepting a new submarine every four weeks. Today, the old guard is gone, but the large number of submarines they built are still there. Although the Russian Navy is now busily disposing of its old uh, submarines, it's also trying to sell off a lot of its less old and newer boats to emerging nations. There is now the risk of third world nations, of another Saddam Hussein getting hold of a submarine and threatening merchant shipping in one part of the world or another. With countries such as Cuba, Libya, North Korea building submarine forces, the threat they pose may be greater than an all-out war among superpowers. When you consider the number of weapons in the third world, the fact that 42 other countries have submarines today, more countries, Iran for example, Singapore, Malaysia, more countries are getting submarines. The underwater world is becoming more dangerous. And I question if the United States will have the resources to effectively confront countries in the underwater environment, let alone fight them. The submarine wasn't always considered such a threat. At the turn of the century, the first underwater boats were almost toy-like compared to the ironclad dreadnoughts of the day. As an experimental boat, they were interesting, but few admirals considered them as serious weapons of war. The first U.S. Navy submarine, the USS Holland, carried torpedoes and a small cannon, but they were immobile, welded inside her bow. The Holland had to be turned precisely in the direction of its target to fire, and without a periscope, it rarely scored a hit in practice. Improved submarines followed, with longer hulls, diesel engines, and greater ranges. They began to show promise, but it took a world war to make most people take notice of them.
As the Great War spread across Europe and into the Atlantic in 1914, the British and German navies defied convention and held back their large warships, preferring to blockade each other's harbors instead. By 1915, with large numbers of British mines off the coast, the German high command turned to its small U-boat force to prosecute the war. With a mixture of bravery and ruthlessness, these submariners set out on the Atlantic in search of vessels bound for England. When they spotted the smoke from a merchant ship, submarine would race at high speed until they could identify what kind of a target it was. When they got within sight of the target, they would figure out which direction the target was going, try to race ahead of the target on the surface to get an angle that as the ship approached, they could fire their torpedoes at it. Once in position, the U-boat would slip beneath the surface and sneak up on its target. Using its periscope, it would then line up the torpedo shot, fire depending upon the size of the target, the importance, one, two, three, maybe even four torpedoes. In the first four months of 1917, two million tons of cargo were lost. The submarine had arrived as a viable weapon of war. When the Americans resolved to enter the war in 1917, their expeditionary force was the largest army ever to leave U.S. shores and the first to fight in Europe. To pass through the submarine-infested waters, the Navy grouped large passenger ships and cargo vessels together with warships to sail in convoys. The first means of defense for these ships was suggested by the British, who discovered dazzle painting. By brushing red and black abstract designs on the vessel's sides, its profile was found to be less pronounced on the high seas and appeared to blend into the horizon. This patchwork of cubism also made it more difficult to determine the ship's speed and direction, and less than 1% of all dazzle-painted ships were lost at sea. Other anti-submarine measures, however, weren't quite as effective. The standard anti-submarine system was to find a submarine submerged using its periscope, to row across to it, put a black bag over the periscope, and smash out the glass of the periscope with a hammer. That system remained a standard operational technique until 1917. As flying boats came off the assembly line, they were seen as an attractive scouting vehicle to protect convoys near the coast. And it wasn't really until 1917 that aircraft became a potent anti-submarine weapon. Not only were they fast and able to catch submarines on the surface, but because of their height, they were able to look down into the water and see shallow dive submarines and attack them with gunfire. The airship was also coming into its own as a reliable scouting vehicle. It could stay aloft longer, carry more personnel, and it made an ideal bombing platform. During the war, the Royal Navy used more than 200 lighter-than-air blimps off the English coast to seek out and occasionally attack German submarines. But the best weapon to guard against the U-boats and ensure the safety of the convoys was the destroyer escort. The old four pipers were rugged and dependable, even in the worst weather. It was found that the destroyer, because of its high speed and relatively long endurance, was an ideal craft to counter the submarine. If it caught it on the surface, it had sufficient gunfire and torpedo power to sink it. Four-inch guns awaited the U-boats on the surface. The difficulty was finding them underwater. Initially, the only way you could detect a submarine was to see it. But once they were underwater, you could hear the noise as the submarine went through the water, the flow noises, as they now call them. So passive hydrophones, just listening devices, were hung over the sides of ships to listen for submarines. The hydrophones were simply underwater microphones. If their operators heard a U-boat close by, they would release smoke screens to buy more time. 
Then, after positioning themselves above the submarine, the destroyer men unleashed their most effective weapon, the depth charge. First introduced in 1916 by the British, the depth charges were packed with about 300 pounds of explosive TNT. The depth charge looked like a trash can, and you would just roll it off the back of a ship as you passed over the submarine. And hopefully the explosion would destroy the submarine. Very soon they fitted hydrostatic fuses to these, which were devices that would explode the depth charge at a preset depth. When the depth charge explodes underwater near a submarine, not only is it the force of explosive that might damage the submarine, but the water itself that goes out from the explosion of the depth charge has tremendous force. And it's hoped that the explosive force will buckle plates on the submarine or break things that will cause a casualty that will force the submarine to the surface. Once on top, the Germans were outgunned and outmanned. By the war's end, 178 of the Untersee boats were on the bottom. The convoy system of destroyer escorts proved to be a resounding success. Of the 16,000 ships that sailed in convoys, only 96 were sunk. The destroyers that fought in the First World War found their toughest adversary at home. Peace through disarmament was the spirit which moved the Washington Arms Conference of 1922. As a result, over 200 U.S. destroyers were eventually mothballed, and the construction of new destroyers came to a standstill for nearly 12 years. The submarine, however, continued to evolve advances in torpedo designs, faster engines, and powerful deck guns made them more lethal than ever. The airplane was seen by many to have the most potential in an anti-submarine role. One of the first craft built specifically to track subs was the NC-4 flying boat. It captured the world's headlines in 1919 by flying from Rockaway, New York to Lisbon, Portugal. The NC-4 demonstrated aircraft could patrol an area the width of the Atlantic. Airplanes also made effective smokescreen dispensers, blocking the surface fleet out of a submarine's periscope. The Martin torpedo bomber could deliver torpedoes against surface ships, but to drop them on submarines, sufficient underwater guidance systems would have to be developed. Airships were also the subject of experimentation. When the USS Los Angeles took on an airplane in 1929, many predicted it would become the ultimate anti-submarine system. But airships required special handling and proved cumbersome when they were deployed with surface ships. Their inability to operate in foul weather convinced the Navy to look elsewhere. After the Japanese victory at Pearl Harbor, and their successive conquests in the Philippines and neighboring islands, the U.S. Navy turned to its versatile Catalina PBY flying boat to combat Japanese submarines. The Catalinas were ideally suited for sub-hunting. Without the need for runways, they could be forward-based on remote islands in the South Pacific. Speed wasn't its best asset. With a crew of 10 and a full bomb load, it could fly barely more than 100 miles an hour. It was like a truck. I mean, it was a, it, it was a airplane that you had to hoist around. You had to, you had to muscle it a little bit, but it could sure do an awful lot of things. The crews aboard the Catalinas were among the first to use sonoboys. These were floating boys with a hydrophone on one end and a radio transmitter on the other. 
After dropping a number of Sonoboys in a grid-like pattern across the water, the crew in the air listened to their radio for the noise of Japanese submarines. Since sound travels up to 20 times farther in water than in the air, the hydrophone operators could accurately measure the sub's course and speed as it passed from one buoy to the next. If destroyers were in the area, the course was marked with flares and the ships were guided in for the attack. The Catalinas also employed one of the first prototype magnetic anomaly detectors. Now this is simply a, a magnetometer attached to the tail end of an airplane. This uh, magnetometer would detect anything metallic that had passed directly over. The idea was to fly these uh, airplanes over the water. If you passed over a submerged submarine, it would give you an indication. And with this indication, then, uh, we were able to track that submarine underneath the water and get effects on his movement and then fly down that line of movement and attack the submarine even though you couldn't see it. PBY Catalinas were also used in the Caribbean and Atlantic against a new generation of German submarines. Between 1939 and 1943, the Untersee boats wreaked havoc once again against convoys headed toward England. Even the mighty British battleship Barham was no match for three well-placed U-boat torpedoes. The German submariners had a new tactic they called the Wolf Pack. This time they operated in groups of six to ten and concentrated their operations in the middle of the Atlantic, where it was difficult for shore-based aircraft to patrol for long periods. They had an immediate and devastating effect on merchant shipping. During the Battle of the Atlantic, they were able to sink vast numbers of British and Allied merchant ships that were sailing alone or that were stragglers from convoys. And this led to the development of air cover. With most of the US carriers tied up in the Pacific, a number of merchant vessels were fitted with flat tops to become small airplane launching pads. Designated escort carriers, they lacked the speed and size of conventional carriers. Although their decks had room for as few as 20 aircraft, their presence was felt immediately. The carriers also brought with them a new type of torpedo. Until World War II, torpedoes were what are called straight runners. You fired them, launched them from an aircraft, they went in a straight line to the target. During World War II, the U.S. started using acoustic homing torpedoes. Torpedoes that when they entered the water, began searching for the sounds generated by a submarine. The kill ratio of launching these weapons and the torpedo striking the submarine was very high, almost 100% when they were introduced. Oil on the surface meant the U-boat had hit the bottom. Airborne radar systems were placed aboard long-range B-24 Liberators, allowing them to sneak up on surfaced subs. These aircraft would take off with a crew of about 20 people and fly into the middle of the Atlantic find the convoy they were allocated to protect, and they were equipped with depth charges and bombs, and a pack of four cannon under the fuselage with which to attack these submarines. At night, from about the, the middle of 1942, the B-24s used powerful searchlights called Lee lights, so they could sneak up on a U-boat, catch it on the surface, and attempt to sink it. While air power was gaining the edge against the submarines, destroyers were also being modified with an array of top secret sensors and weapons. During the Second World War, the threat of submarine attack wasn't just confined to the open oceans. Merchant ships were equally vulnerable inside harbors where submarines could slip in 
and attack them at will. Along the U.S. coast, airships and PT boats patrol day and night. With a crew of nine, each PT boat carried four torpedoes and twin machine guns. Still, the battleground was underwater. For protection, strategically important harbors were lined with a series of steel cables. The standard anti-submarine defense system was the net. Each harbor was netted with steel mesh nets to try and catch the submarines, prevent them from moving. They were then vulnerable and could be counterattacked. Anti-submarine nets were in use throughout the First World War, developed during this, the interwar period, and were used extensively in the Second World War. Perhaps the most capable anti-submarine weapon of all was the venerable destroyer. Deployed alongside convoys crossing the Atlantic, they kept a constant vigil against the U-boats. There were two major developments which enabled surface warships during the Second World War to detect submarines. The first was the advent of radar, a masttop radio receiving equipment which could send out a signal and receive a bounce back from any object in the water, such as a surfaced submarine. And this was particularly useful at night. Also, development had been carried out by the British, to a certain extent by the French and the Americans, into an underwater detection system Initially it was called ASDIC, but eventually it became known as sonar. It's an underwater radar system which sends out a sound pulse which detects an object in the water by the return bounce coming back and measuring the time between it. it gives you an indication of range and direction. The British tightened the noose even further with a shortwave radio detector that pinpointed the location of U-boats when they transmitted communications to their headquarters in France. World War II was the beginnings of the electronic war. Radar, sonar, electronic intercept. Suddenly, sounds and visions created by sounds became very important. Now try and get that noise firmly into your head, because one of these days, I'm sure, you're going to pick it up. And then you'll know just what it means. With improved hydrophones, Trained operators could recognize the U-boat's distinctive noise signature, complements of its noisy power plant and spinning propeller. As long as it's one destroyer, it is not serious. If there are two destroyers, and in the second part of the World War, there were always two or even three destroyers, then it's almost impossible for a submarine to survive. Because once the destroyer stops, finds the direction with the solar. Another one from another angle does the same. And the third destroyer runs and gets a signal from the other destroyer when to drop the depth charges. Because then they have not only the direction, but also the depth. As detection improved, weapons also improved. Instead of rolling depth charges off the stern of the ship as you passed over it, we developed what were called K-guns and Y-guns, which could fire a depth charge a few dozen yards to either side of the ship. This meant as a ship passed over a submarine's location, instead of just rolling off a few depth charges, they could also shoot them out to the sides and have a whole pattern, which increased the probability of hitting the submarine. By mid-World War II, the U.S. and British navies began using what were called a head-firing anti-submarine weapons. These fired very small explosive charges. They were called hedgehogs or mousetraps. They would fire a pattern of eight or ten of these at an enemy submarine's believed location. When they entered the water, they would not explode until they hit a submarine. So if they missed the submarine, there was no explosion to interrupt your sonar. A depth charge above you, or even on the side of you, makes a lot of noise, rocks the boat, maybe the lights go out, and it's very frightening. But it doesn't do any deadly harm. But as soon as a depth charge is close to you and explodes beneath you, then it breaks the keel and the boat is gone.
I don't believe that there are atheists on this earth. If somebody states he is an atheist, and if he is the most ardent communist, I take him on my submarine and expose him to a depth charge. You will see how fast he is on his knees and prays to his God. Ship launched, acoustical homing torpedoes added to the U-boat's growing list of worries. Faster, smarter, and used in greater numbers, the anti-submarine forces proved too much for the U-boats. After World War II, helicopters became practical and effective weapons of anti-submarine warfare. Helicopters could fly far ahead of the fleet, and with a variety of special sensors, they could detect submarines and immediately drop weapons on their elusive targets. Almost from the onset, the potential to deploy helicopters at sea was in the minds of designers and the Navy. They began testing the Sikorsky R-4 in 1943, but for 10 years, the helicopter's role was limited to reconnaissance and transport details. The Sikorsky S-58 Seabat was one of the first helicopters designed with sub-hunting in mind and was first flown off aircraft carriers in 1954. Helicopters were very useful because they could fly out to the site of a very tentative detection, carrying sonar buoys or magnetic anomaly detection or some other device. The helicopter could hover over the water and lower an active sonar into the water to try to localize the submarine. With the odds stacked against them, submarine engineers looked for ways to regain an advantage. By removing the outside guns and railings from the U.S. fleet boats, they got a quieter, faster submarine overnight. Smooth, tear-shaped hulls finally allowed the submarine to travel faster underwater than on the surface. The greatest breakthrough came in 1954 with nuclear-powered steam engines. Now the submarine could travel for months or even years at a time. But that luxury came with a price. The one great disadvantage with a nuclear-powered submarine is its nuclear propulsion system is more noisy than the conventional diesel electric submarine. When running on its electric batteries, a diesel submarine is almost noiseless, but there's always the noise of the water pump in a nuclear-powered submarine. Like the Americans, the Soviets grasped the potential of atomic power. And in 1958, their first nuclear-powered submarines were put to sea. The Grumman S-2 Tracker was best suited to meet the Soviet threat. In the 1950s, aircraft carriers were dedicated solely to the purpose of anti-submarine warfare, and they depended on the Tracker for long-range fleet defense. With a new generation of sensitive sonoboys, the Trackers surveyed a wider span of ocean than ever before. Its onboard radar could pick up targets as small as a periscope and a retractable magnetic anomaly detector kept watch for any unusually large metal objects below. Once they made a detection, S-58 sea bats were dispatched to the region to isolate the sound with active sonar, classify it as friendly or hostile, and continue to track it. Most surface combat ships built after the Second World War had large sonar domes built into their bows. They also carried weapons designed to defeat the submarine from greater distances than ever before. The remote control dash for drone anti-submarine helicopter was designed to prolong the life of vintage World War II destroyers. Dash carried two homing torpedoes and could be guided as far as 70 miles away. Anti-submarine rockets, called ASROCs, were added to destroyers. The ASROC could throw an acoustic homing torpedo more than six miles. Along with improved homing torpedoes, Weapon Alpha was introduced to escort ships. It could launch a 500-pound rocket-propelled depth charge nearly 3,000 feet. But as always, the surface ship 
had to know where to fire. One of the advantages that a submarine commander has is being able to move in the water. The water is not homogeneous. It has layers of different salinity and temperature. He can move between these layers and distort sound or even blanket sound completely. A submarine moving at, say, 120 feet below the water may be completely undetectable to a surface ship with a hull-mounted sonar. But if that ship has a variable depth sonar, which can go down to 120 feet, it can detect that submarine by listening to the noise of the motors or the crew. So the variable depth sonar was developed almost rather like the system of a dunking sonar from a helicopter. It's dropped from the back of a ship on a long cable and can be controlled from the ship to vary in depth. Seafloor detectors were designed and placed in contested waterways. These giant hydrophones monitored submarine movements and relayed sounds to evaluation centers by underwater cable. As deep diving nuclear powered submarines began to enter the US Navy fleet, they had a new mission to seek out and destroy other submarines in their own environment. The best weapon to attack another submarine with is a submarine. To do this, it used passive sonar systems, which only listened to the noise generated by enemy submarines. It also could, in an emergency, use an active system, which would send out a signal, which would bounce back off the hull, but thereby it would give itself away. During the Cold War, these cat and mouse operations were centered primarily in the North Pacific, North Atlantic, and beneath the polar ice caps. The aim of the game was to find out what the Soviets were doing, how they were doing it, and even follow them back into their own harbors to gain intelligence. In the 1960s, the primary submarine attack torpedo was the Mark 37. It used thin, high-strength metal wires that unspooled behind it to receive steering commands from the fire control men in the submarine. At a certain distance, the wire broke free and the torpedo turned on its active sonar. Although the active sonar guidance gave the torpedo's position away, it was hoped to be so close to its target as not to matter. Overall, the Mark 37 had a range of five miles. powered USS Permit prepares to submerge for an underwater test firing of the Navy's newest and deadliest long-range submarine killer, Sub Rock. In 1965, the Navy went operational with Sub Rock, an anti-submarine rocket with a revolutionary depth charge. Sub Rock, capable of being fired from conventional torpedo tubes, is the Navy's latest answer to the threat of missile firing enemy submarines. The depth charge separated from its rocket and re-entered the water up to 30 miles away. The sub rock's guidance didn't need to be precise. Its warhead was a nuclear bomb and could obliterate any submarine within three to five miles. Since it first flew in 1959, the Lockheed P-3 Orion has established itself as the world's premier submarine hunter-killer. Continually upgraded and improved, the Orions are still on active duty. As with most anti-submarine aircraft, Sonoboys are the key to the Orion's success. In flights that can last up to 16 hours, 10 crew members work together with fully automated computers to monitor and process the signals of up to 99 Son of Boys at a time. The boy's depth and life expectancy are preset. After one, four, or eight hours of monitoring and transmitting sounds, they take in water and sink. The noises are recorded inside the Orion and then matched with a library of sounds of suspected submarines in the area. Anybody can be trained to go out and land and take off on an airplane, especially one as forgiving as a P-3. The difference is, is when you're out on station and you're only a few hundred feet above the water and you're traveling about 250 miles an hour and uh, you're bending that airplane around a very small area of that ocean and you know somewhere down there 
uh, several hundred feet underneath the uh, surface, there's a large metallic metal object that you're trying to search for. The Orion has carried a variety of weapons over the years, from homing torpedoes, to depth charges, and for surface attacks, the Rock Eye Cluster Bomb. The Navy decommissioned its last anti-submarine carrier in 1974, and since then, the sea-based sub-hunters have flown with the rest of the battle group. The S-3A Viking is the Navy's latest aircraft for this role. It carries a crew of four and can remain on station as long as necessary with the help of in-flight refueling. The S-3 Viking is a carrier-based fixed-wing ASW aircraft. Like its larger cousin, the P-3 Orion, it has radar, sonar buoys, and certain other detection devices, such as an ability to intercept communications from a submarine. Like a P-3, you want to guide it to the general area where you think there's a submarine contact. Once it locates the submarine, it can again use depth charges or homing torpedoes or rockets to attack. The Sikorsky Sea King was the standard carrier-based sub-hunter after it first flew in 1966. But in the 1970s, the Navy looked to give smaller cruisers, frigates, and destroyers their own submarine fighting capability. The Cayman H-2 Sea Sprite was selected to carry a revolutionary system called LAMPS, which featured a digital communications link between the helicopter and the ship's combat information center. Here, trained personnel could monitor all the H-2 sensors and with their mainframe computers, help process twice as many Sonoboys boys as before. Today, the H-2 is being replaced with the Sikorsky Seahawk. The ship will initially pick up a contact um, maybe uh, 100 miles from, from their own platform. They'll process the information, they'll decide whether or not it's a valid contact, and at that point, we'll fly out and lay various sonar buoy patterns, uh, which allow us to uh, either regain or maintain the contact that we already have off of the ship. And uh, once we lay those patterns out, we can make a determination of what the uh, contact's course and speed is, uh, possibly his depth, and uh, then we can lay a Mark 46 torpedo on our, on our track. The SH-60B is used on smaller combatants and deploys passive listening son of boys. The F model, SH-60, uses active sonar and is flown off aircraft carriers. Because the aircraft carrier operates with a large number of ships in a formation, they're putting a lot of noise into the water from the passage of the ships from their propellers. It's very hard to use passive sonar in that environment because the noise from the ship's propellers and the ship's passage is destroying the environment and they can't hear an enemy submarine. The helicopters aboard a carrier, in addition to carrying sonar buoys, themselves carry an active sonar. They can fly out a mile or so in front of the carrier force, drop their own sonar at the end of a cable into the water and start pinging looking for submarines that might be in the vicinity. The Los Angeles-class attack submarine began service in 1976. Today, an improved version has a wartime mission to seek and destroy enemy submarines. With a nuclear-powered submarine, our only limit for remaining underwater is the amount of food we have on board. We make our own oxygen, we make our own water, we carry all the supplies we need, and we can remain deployed for long periods of time and go forward and carry the battle forward. And the only thing we have to come back for then is food or if we were to run out of weapons. The sonar room is the eyes and ears of the attack sub. Here, sonar bearings of submarine and ship contacts are presented visually on a display terminal. The sounds they hear are like fingerprints. No two classes of submarines sound the same. Well, this particular ship and most of the submarines currently out right now 
unlike what you see in movies, there's no need to go to periscope depth to attack contact. Bridge, we're fully we're capable of carrying out an attack on either a surface or a submerged contact without ever seeing them, just on sonar bearings. The way that works is just teamwork between the sonarmen and the fire control technicians. Uh, we send them bearings, our estimate of range, and they do their best to solve for what they think range is. And between us, we come up with what we think the solution is, and it works. U.S. Navy attack submarines carry the Mark 48 torpedo. Its warhead consists of 750 pounds of high explosives. Upon launching, wire guidance permits two-way closed communication between the submarine and the torpedo. With a reported range of almost 30 miles, it has active sonar and passive acoustical searching modes. War, of course, is measure, weapon, and countermeasure, counterweapon. We now have submarines that are coated with anechoic or sound absorbing material, which reduce the effectiveness of the torpedo sonar and enemy submarine sonar. The latest research involves satellites equipped with radar and optical sensors to track shallow submerged submarines. Ironically, this emerging science is necessary because of so-called old technology. Third world subs use silent diesel electric power plants and are inherently quieter than the Russian nuclear subs. There's no sign that the proliferation of submarines is decreasing I think more nations will go for submarines. As more nations go for submarines, other nations will have to have anti-submarine warfare systems. The best anti-submarine warfare system is another submarine, but that doesn't mean to say that helicopters and surface ships won't be needed. There'll still be the development of long-range maritime patrol aircraft in the anti-submarine role, and I think what we'll see is more and more space-based systems. It might be a low priority today, but I don't think it will be in the next century. Technological advances come to both the hunter and the hunted, and the fragile balance is still maintained. However, anti-submarine warfare is still an imprecise science. Some people believe that soon there will be a device that renders the ocean transparent. But until then, anti-submarine warfare remains a deadly game of chess that requires not only the skillful movement of highly trained and specialized players, but plain common sense and good luck.